largest, most powerful, most feared, and most widespread of the pseudo-wyverns, Tigrex is well known for many aspects of its behaviour and physiology. Their deafening roar, considerable aggression, and great strength are perhaps signature traits, and ones that often bring them into conflict with man across their broad geographic range. But why are Tigrex often described as nomadic across this range? And how does this tie in to impact other aspects of their behaviour and ecology as well? Let's find out. So to start, just how loud may Tigrex actually be? Considering that their roars quite literally cause physical damage to the hunter when they're too close, very is a good start. Research on military applications of sound for weaponry showed that damage occurs to the human body at around 130 decibels and up. At 140 to 150, you get strong physical trauma and damage to tissues, and at 170, you get instantaneous blast wave type trauma. And if that's not a perfect description of getting caught in a Tigrex roar, I don't know what is. So 170 seems reasonable, and maybe a bit higher for brute Tigrex. This also suggests that, unsurprisingly, Tigrex uses low frequencies, or has low frequency components in its roar as these match up with lower frequency impacts. High and ultrasound frequencies are more likely to produce burns and tissue lesions. Very low frequencies can also apparently cause uncontrollable defecation in some urban myths, and according to some in-game dialogue, this can occur as a result of a Tigrex roar too. Whether this is due to the trauma of the blast or the fear of the encounter is unknown so it's inconclusive whether Tigrex can actually cause the mythical brown note in humans. But this level of noise is also well within the ranges of living things to produce, and compared to some oceanic life is pretty small fry. Some types of blue whale call average 186 decibels, and the maximum recorded was 188. Sperm whales can get up to 236 decibels, which is believed to be the loudest utterance from any living thing and carries for thousands of miles across the ocean. The natural follow-ups to this are the how and the why. For the how, different animals achieve incredible volume in different ways. Whales partly by being massive, some birds, bats and monkeys by having very specialised gear for their body size. Tigrex may be partly in between, its large size will already help it achieve great amplitude, but a look inside it shows how it may achieve this. The larynx is large and muscular, with what seems to be a very broad, robust hyoid bone, and possibly even the surrounding cartilage replaced with bone too. Tigrex's lungs and related air sacs are large, and take up a huge volume of the torso, and this is also likely where the sound comes from. Tigrex can't super roar in any position, and clearly needs to brace itself and get into the right stance, with the roar also taking considerable effort. So Tigrex's deafening bellows are seemingly created by forcing a large volume of air out at great speed and pressure through a specially reinforced larynx. Really quite similar to a howler monkey, but far larger and thus louder. It's surprising but not unheard of to have morphology so skewed to create incredible sounds. Hammer-headed fruit bats, Africa's largest bat, have males that have undertaken great specialisations to be able to make incredibly loud ringing noises, to woo females, to the point where their larynx fills half the bodily cavity, and leaves less room for the other organs, to say nothing of their massive nose. The reason these bats are so devoted to noise production is due to their courtship, as they're one of the very few bats to lack. In rough terms, this is where multiple males who exhibit no parental care come to an arena, to perform for a female who then selects a mate, which is precisely what the bats do. The males gather in forest clearings to all have a good scream, and the females pick the loudest and most impressive males. This also sounds like a pretty reasonable suggestion for Tigrex courtship, and a contributing factor why Tigrex developed to be so loud in the first place. It's unknown if Tigrex would engage in traditional legs, or exploded ones, which are legs that are much more spaced apart and tend to depend on auditory displays over visual ones. This may fit for Tigrex, considering that it's hard to believe that multiple male Tigrex in sight of one another wouldn't just turn into a bloodbath. The volume of said roars may also mean the female prefers to keep a distance to choose, but this isn't necessarily the case all of the time. 
White bellbirds are the loudest known bird, and predictably the males use their deafening 113 decibel calls to attract mates. But despite the volume, the females often land on the same perch, and are screamed at at close range by the males. So whether female tigrex admire from afar or risk getting hearing damage is hard to say. But there are a few other things to consider too. One of the big aspects of tigrex behaviour is that they're described as nomadic, or travelling over huge areas. And leks are more often used by territorial animals. Another is that as far as we know, there's nothing to say that tigrex have big sexual dimorphism. And so female tigrex seem about as well equipped for volume production as males. But there's nothing to say that females can't initiate leks. In Bradbury's conservative definition, an animal can still seemingly be nomadic and have female-made leks and still fit these points. So maybe female tigrex use their own huge voices to announce availability to draw the males in, bringing them to a certain area where they begin to lek, and she takes her pick. Similar behaviours are partially seen in some other large predators, and female mountain lions will call to announce availability and attract males. Whilst most other cats use scent marks, and these still play a role in mountain lion communication, this may be a chief supporting reason why tigrex are so loud. Their calls are similar to the equivalent of scent marking. In Monster Hunter, we see various different ways animals mark their territory. In the territorial brute wyverns, we see scent and signal marking are common, with Brachidios's slime, Baroth's mud, Anjanath's snot, and Glavinus's tails. In flying wyverns, Rathalos creates talon scrapes, and considering the talons have potential to envenomate, it may be it leaves traces of these proteins as a scent mark to ward off other Rathalos and inform Rathians. Tigrex's method is sound, but if Tigrex aren't defending a specific area, then regular updates on their location will still be important and of use to other Tigrex as they travel. By letting other Tigrex know where they are, it can reduce likelihood of conflict between them. It can signal mating opportunities and inform them of recent kills. If Tigrex attacks affect Popo and other prey movements, it's worthwhile to know when a conspecific has made a kill, so other tigrex can change their movements accordingly to maximise chances of prey encounter. Odd as it may sound, many animals use sound as their primary communication. Birds as a whole class do, and many mammals like wolves with their howls and lions with their roars have vocalisations as a key form of information between species. As with these species, tigrex can likely identify each other with their calls, and this provides further contextual information that to them may prove important. Nomadic behaviour may also affect other aspects of their social interaction, and possibly vice versa too. Some animals can give clues as to how the nomadic nature can influence behaviours, Honey badgers are animals with huge home ranges for their small size, with females especially to accommodate their large single offspring. As such, they may provide a good few similarities that we can use to make suggestions for for tigrex. With females likely being a limiting resource for males, male tigrex are also forced to be nomadic, rather than defend a set area if female tigrex don't have a season they breed in and as well if tigrex are polygamous like a few other wyvern species. This may also in turn prompt male tigrex to be larger and spend more time on the move, and at a quicker pace, so that they can cover more ground and increase their odds of finding the nomadic females. This could contribute to how such roaming behaviour started, with males following the females who followed the prey. Mobility is no doubt a big part of a successful male's methodology, and they may locate and try to stay comparatively close to females as often as they can, to increase odds of being the first in at Lex. Indeed, as well as movement, memory and perception may also be big parts of locating such females. And whilst its bullheadedness may supersede any intellect, there may still be more than just dumb muscle to Tigrex. This may come with some costs for male Tigrex, as their increased movement also means greater energetic demand, but also greater likelihood of bumping into other monsters. Unlike honey badgers though, tigrex are top predators, and pretty powerful even by wyvern standards, only really having to worry about possible elder dragons. So one of the chief risks of the behaviour is greatly diminished. Similarly, it also means potentially having to square off with other males over the female, but then this may well be intended by the desired females as part of the lex. 
Despite outward appearances and design motifs, it's hard to say just how behaviourally similar the pseudo ivans are to felids, or indeed other mammals, but an additional reason for nomadic behaviour could be to avoid infanticide. Sexually selective infanticide is most well known in lions, who are something of a poster boy for the behaviour. If people can list five facts about lions, one will likely be that a male coalition taking over a new pride tends to kill the present cubs, to bring the females back into Estrus to have his own offspring. But this behaviour is often seen in other cats too, as well as other carnivorans like bears, and many other mammals like ungulates and rodents. So it's pretty widespread, but one felid that doesn't do it is the cheetah. Theories as to why are mixed, but one is that the nomadic behaviour of female cheetahs means that even if a male killed a mother's cubs, she's not likely to stay in the area for him to mate with her. On top of this, the polygamy tigrex likely exhibit, plus this nomadic behaviour, may mean that for a male tigrex, there's a chance that any youngsters he finds may be his own. He can't kill them in any confidence that they're not his, and so are unwilling to risk killing their own progeny. As briefly mentioned, tigrex's chief reason for such wide ranges is the fact that it's following its food. This is similar to other carnivores in unproductive environments, and tundra wolves are unusual for wolves in that they aren't territorial and instead follow the migratory caribou over long distances. With the combination of preying on herd-dwelling herbivores, and the comparatively barren habitats it often frequents, Tigrex likely does the same, and goes where the prey goes, picking off individuals in the group, chiefly Popo in colder regions but also Apsaros in arid areas, and Aptanoth in the grassier steppes and savannas. Popo in particular may be a preferred choice for tigrex, and indeed, tigrex trying or succeeding in hunting them is the most common predator-prey interaction shown throughout the series, being shown on six occasions from eight tigrex hunts. Tigrex may accordingly impact popo behaviour, and popo do seem to alter their movement patterns to try and respond to such threats. Popo seemingly move to higher elevation areas after Tigrex attacks to try and avoid encounters, and won't enter areas after hearing Tigrex vocalizations nearby. So much of Tigrex's extensive ranging behavior may just be it keeping up with Popo herds that are constantly altering their own movements to try and avoid it. One thing that's sometimes suggested is that Tigrex is a desert animal that seasonally moves to the mountains to hunt Popo and this seems unlikely to say the least. Using the only map given of the Old World, the area believed to be the desert is as far away from the snowy mountains as you can get, and Tigrex would literally have to cross a continent on foot to get there and back. Not especially likely. What's more likely is that they're altitudinal migrants, and like other mountain herbivores, the Popo themselves move through different areas of the mountains at different times of year, for carving, foraging, and trying to avoid tigrex, with the tigrex following them up and down the mountains. Lack of actual identification of individual tigrex, plus a wide distribution across continents, may give rise to the belief that they literally walk from shore to shore after Popo. But then, what's the deal with all the different groups of tigrex across the world? There are three theories we can go for here. One, that each area Tigrex inhabit is a genetically distinct subpopulation with next to no gene admixture between populations. So really, Tigrex may have around six or seven subspecies depending on your classification. New World Tigrex are most likely all one population except for broods. But it could also be possible that the Hoarfrost and Mainland populations are genetically distinct. Two, that almost all tigrex except for brutes and maybe new world tigrex are one big population with plenty of mixing between ecozones due to long dispersal and tigrex's nomadic behavior. Or three, a little from column A and a little from column B. Many animals in past years who have been speculated to have dozens of subspecies have had these drastically reduced. Cougars were once suggested to have 32 subspecies, but genetic analysis suggests there are just two. Certain environments can lead to significant differences though. Wolves are another animal that have undergone a subspecies cull, but some like the Himalayan or woolly wolf have been found to be significantly genetically distinct to other wolves, and ancient in origin. So maybe most tigrex are one genetic grouping with plenty of admixture, but certain populations are significantly cut off from the others 
to the point of being genetically distinct. Not all habitats are equal though, and in their wandering quest for food, certain places may exist to Tigrex's detriment. The Rotten Vale may be one such area. Different habitats function as sources or sinks, with sources providing a surplus of animals that leave via dispersal, and sinks preventing reproduction and causing mortality to create a deficit. Attractive sinks are habitats that appeal to the primary conditions an animal is looking for, but possess something that still makes it a sink for that species' population. And the veil may serve as such for tigrex. It's unknown how tigrex reproduce, but it doesn't seem likely that they can in the veil, as eggs or young wouldn't likely survive the effluvium. The long-term survival of the adults is in question too. The bounty of carrion may draw dispersing or wandering tigrex in, and it meets many of their needs but ultimately doesn't allow for reproduction, and so functions as an attractive sink for them. The source population of the mainland of the New World is presumably the wild spire waste, and whilst Tigrex appears at home in the desert and indeed the grassy steppes, his ability to survive in the snow is often questioned. Now's a good time to refresh everyone that once you get over a few tons in weight, being massive and thermal inertia mean cold isn't really a big problem. Tigrex is a pretty active animal, often moving. And this combined with size mean that Tigrex likely doesn't need much in the way of insulation. Rather, it and other monsters would rather need adaptations to shed heat. And this may be why many wyverns that are comparatively flightless still keep their wings as thermal windows. By pushing blood through vascularized skin, they can shed a lot of body heat. Tigrex can also adjust the extension of the wing too, and so fully extend for maximum heat loss and retract for heat retention. Other points of scepticism come from Tigrex's colour. Surely an orange and blue wyvern is going to stick out in the snow. Well, maybe not so much. Otherwise, real world tigers would be up the creek without a paddle here too. Part of it may well come from the fact that in Palearctic areas, Tigrex mainly seems to hunt mammals, like popo and gamoth calves, and other potential prey like bears or lagombi would likely be in the same boat. To many mammals that have dichromatic vision, the colour orange isn't seen the same way we see it with our trichromatic vision. It's unknown how it appears on white, but ammo tigers don't seem to be any less successful hunting in snow, so it doesn't seem to be a big issue. So tigrex may not stick out as much as many initially expect. Well, to most prey at least. Blangonga almost certainly has trichromatic vision, as both a primate and an animal that uses colourful displays. With the hostile nature of the large males, the sharp eyes of the species, and their role as potential prey too, they may endeavour to make themselves a real thorn in Tigrex's side at every opportunity, alarm calling to spoil any hunts, and attempting to mob it out of their territory. With the presence of Copper Blangonga in the deserts, this relationship may also persist well across their range, and may well have been going on for much of their shared evolutionary history. This likely also explains Brute Tigrex's darker colour too. Brute Tigrex fairly exclusively hunts other reptiles, like Apsaros or volcano-dwelling wyverns, all with superior colour vision. For its sooty volcano home, darker individuals were selected for with greater hunting success on such targets. Interestingly, juvenile brute tigrex are described as grey, and darken as they mature, both independently and because of certain dust in the shell. So in tigrex, the deeper the colours may well indicate virility or age in individuals. But no matter the location, tigrex are equipped to hunt big game. Their forelimbs are large and incredibly strong, even by pseudo ivan standards, and able to withstand considerable stresses and subjugate animals even larger than themselves. They also have curved claws that are the largest of any flying wyvern and provide excellent grip. Similarly, their cranial region is of course very reminiscent of Tyrannosaurids, a family of theropods that were incredibly robust and well adapted to withstand incredible stresses when feeding, anchoring onto large, struggling prey or exerting incredibly high bite forces. Indeed, Tigrex is a reasonable candidate for highest bite force relative to body mass among the monsters, and is overall equipped to kill animals both the same size and likely larger than itself. But all this power comes at a cost, and as a result Tigrex is certainly the slowest and least agile pseudo-ivan with the worst volant ability. 
the closest Tigrex achieves to flight is a poorly controlled glide, that can occasionally even pain the animal on landing, and it's the slowest and least able to both turn and halt its own momentum of the pseudo Ivans too. Tigrex does seem to have a clear goal in the ethology of its predation, and that's to go for the throat. Considering the swiftness of the kill and the design of said jaws, it's probably not for suffocation, but more likely catastrophic trauma to the cervical vertebrae that kills its target. Tigrex will often use its powerful forelimbs to restrain prey before doing so, and this makes it interesting that Tigrex also has a skull so robust and well designed to resist stress. The massive forelimbs should be sufficient, and often are, at restraining monsters of equal and somewhat greater mass, so it almost seems overkill that the jaws are so heavily built as well. But bone crushing jaws are probably more important for eating than they are for killing. Due to how energy rich bone marrow is, a kilogram of bone is as energetically valuable as a kilogram of meat, if you have the tools to process it. Which Tigrex of course does. It's also worth considering too, over a large portion of its range and in arid areas, Tigrex's primary prey will likely be Apsaros. To consume such a heavily armoured animal will take serious equipment, and whilst it's hard to say which biome Tigrex initially evolved into the animal it is today in, its ability to process so much of an Apsaros carcass no doubt allowed it to spread across the deserts of Monster Hunter. On top of being able to eat everything on a carcass, Tigrex is likely a successful scavenger over much of its range, with an excellent sense of smell, a good aerobic ability to track kills, and sufficient brawn to push other carnivores off their prey. Its prevalence in the Rotten Vale also shows that behaviourally, it's no stranger to a free meal either. It can process frozen meat easily, and so readily profits from old Barioth kills, as well as winter-killed animals. Carcass processing may also vary depending on the prey, and mountain tigrex with a diet largely formed of proboscideans may well consume them in a unique way. Tyrannosaurus is suggested to have started eating triceratops from the neck, for the good amount of neck muscle needed to hold up such a heavy head, and would decapitate it in the process, as well as similarly large neck muscles for a heavy head, Proboscideans also have large brains, and their brain is essentially a big lump of sparkling fat. Animals that prey on big-brained targets do often eat them head first to get this nutritious reward, and so Tigrex may well preferentially eat Popo and Young Gamoth head first as well, starting with the energy-rich brain, then the dense neck muscles before consuming the rest of the body. The assorted mountain predators may well leave signature kills they can be identified by, with Barioth leaving a frozen, hollowed out carcass, Tigrex starting to eat head first and then ultimately leaving nothing left, Blangonga leaving picked and disarticulated bones, and Kezu leaving a hollowed out sleeping bag from where the whelps have hatched and eaten it out. Such behaviour may well be an artefact of certain prey and be unique to mountain tigrex with other prey species like Apsaros and Aptomnoth not stimulating such unique feeding. With the killing and eating sorted, the final point is who tigrex hunts, and who it may have evolved to hunt. As said, popo are often a major part of tigrex diet wherever their ranges overlap. Its seeming fondness for them is noted in game lore, and is frequently depicted. Popo are an ideal meal, the perfect combination of fat, muscle and organ to give a large predator like Tigrex everything it needs. Outside of such areas, Tigrex likely just opts for the largest common animal. Apsaros will serve this role well in the desert, and much like with Popo, Tigrex likely follows the herds from water source to water source. In the savannas and steppes, Tigrex likely turn to the bread and butter of other monsters and hunt Aptonoth. We see little of Tigrex in this poorly fleshed out environment, but despite being associated primarily with mountains and deserts much more, Tigrex may actually reach its highest densities in these open grassy steppes due to the large numbers of available game, and these may even resemble its initial habitat the most. Whether Tigrex actually develops some form of territoriality here is unknown, but their social structure may well be significantly different here to other Tigrex, due to more numerous and less mobile resources that can actually be defended in a sedentary lifestyle. But with all of these prey items, it's pretty over-equipped to hunt them. Tigrex clearly doesn't need to be as strong as it is just for Popo, and it's likely in the same boat as Legiana with a Jaguar comparison. 
It's presumably evolved to hunt something larger and more powerful than its current common prey, but it's still able to survive well on smaller animals. One such potential target is famously Gamoth, and Tigrex are said to predate Gamoth calves whenever they get the chance. Gamoth are frequently hostile to Tigrex as a result, and likely from the fact that they kill the Popo Gamoth frequently associate with too. But while some concept art shows Tigrex searching for very young Gamoth calves, which are born white as a form of camouflage, this may not be when Gamoth are most at risk from Tigrex. At this period, the calves are almost certainly under parental care, and spend a lot of time with the mother who will actively defend them from mountain predators. Tigrex may still predate found calves, or attempt to trail mothers to see if an opportunity presents itself. But when under her care, they'll likely be comparatively safe. As Gamoth get older though, the risk likely increases. Much older calves in the later age classes are more likely to stray from the mother, and may still be inexperienced around predators. Indeed, it's often not young elephant calves that elephant specialised lions target. Most elephants killed by such prides are between 5 and 15 years of age, when they're not too big but not so small that they don't stray far from the mother. When Gamoth calves do leave the mother too, the risk may spike even further, until they reach a certain size. With no mother to defend them, they'll be on their own. An unfamiliar Gamoth may not even help them either. Adult bull elephants are rarely concerned by lions predating others of their kind. And male Gamoth calves in particular, that are soon to leave their mother, may well get less help in such situations too. Proboscidean predation is typically very male biased and many Gamoth bulls may not make it to adulthood. Gamoth of these ages may well be an important prey species for Tigrex, and one of the key ones it initially evolved to hunt. Gamoth may have been considerably more numerous in past eons, and herds and numbers of calves to eat far higher. As suggested in Barioth's video, Gamoth aren't just vulnerable to Tigrex. A tiny calf is susceptible to predation from near enough anything, and even when significantly larger, it's still vulnerable to a lot of mountain predators. Smaller predators are likely rarer threats, whereas larger ones like Tigrex probably provide a constant menace through much of their lives, as the other smaller animals fall away. Healthy adult Gamoth are likely immune from the majority of predators, but Devil Joe may still trail individuals to check for any weaknesses and always be ready to pick off vulnerable individuals for a rare feast that can actually satisfy it. Large kills may often bring Tigrex into conflict with other monsters, and Devil Joe may well be its keenest competitor. The two likely share similar ecology, as food-following nomads with broad ranges. Devil Joe may readily steal Tigrex kills at any occasion. Whilst Tigrex may do what it can to keep Devil Joe at bay physically, it does seem such brute wyverns seem to dislike incredibly loud noises, and Tigrex's roar may potentially function as a repellent until it can recoup some food from kills, or tear off a piece to escape with. Like many large predators, Tigrex may take any opportunity to eliminate competition, and probably isn't shy about eating competitors either. Tigrex may have been a possible influence in Gos Harag leaving hibernation behind, reducing its risk of encounters, and also being in a position to actually defend itself if caught by Tigrex. In areas where Tigrex overlap with Azuros, they may potentially dig them out from dens, much as a tiger will with the assorted bears it shares its range with. Tigrex's large claws and strong arms may make it a reasonable digger, for stashed or frozen kills and it may also be able to unearth aestivating amphibians like Tigerstripe Zamtrios or Tetranodon, for an easy kill before they wake from their stupor. Brute Tigrex especially may eat other wyverns, and if Tigrex killing Radoban is anything to go by, in the volcanic areas it may occasionally predate Uragan. An adult Gravios may be a worthy match for even a Brute Tigrex, but young individuals known as Basarios could well be at risk, and brutes may track them with a keen sense of smell and then dig them out. Or eating wyverns may potentially have a greater biomass in volcanic areas than typical prey items like Apsaros, due to living in an area with an abundance of food, compared to more typical herbivores. Few things in the volcano probably live at especially high densities, except for bullfango on powder stone carrying missions, and so brute tigrex may be forced to try and eat anything it comes across in such a harsh environment, with this leading to its reputation for increased aggression. 
and its larger size facilitating a comparatively atypical diet. So for my thoughts on Tigrex, he's probably my favourite monster. Only real competition is perhaps the Blosswivens, and I actually think he shares a lot of parallels with them that are probably my reasons for liking them so much. Clear prehistoric influence, but with a good marriage to the wyvern design, no nonsensical elements, and interesting ecology. All of them are pretty simple fights, but I don't mind that so much. Not everything needs to be a multi-level, area of effect spamming, elemental fireworks display to be a good fight and simpler, brute-strength-based fights can often be refreshing, so long as they have a few good moves that aren't entirely charge-based. Tigrex's fight was always something significant in Freedom 2, or Unite, which more people apparently played, and that it always felt like the strong upgrade to the classic Flying Wyvern fight. Not only did Tigrex not trip at the end of charges, he could turn and segue right into another. Other than the specific taunt, he also had no time-waste attacks, that gave you less chance to sharpen or heal, and he also did a lot of damage. Even with the decently varied newcomers of monkeys, crabs, and base elders, Tigrex still felt like a big deal indeed, and there will never be a tougher Tigrex than second gens. To say nothing of the extensive trauma inflicted on much of the fanbase by the Land of Tremors quest. The stamina mechanic definitely nerfed Tigrex a bit relative to other wyverns, not that he should be exempt from it, but it's still worth noting. Tigrex is also definitely at risk of sliding down the slippery slope to become a Rathian-like monster, with very few updates and a repetitive fight over games, and part of this comes from the almost non-existent updates given in 4th gen, compared to a lot of other monsters. 5th gen does an alright job, and Tigrex is just behind Baryoth in terms of fight quality. He's a bit too slow and easy to really be the best, but the additions to the fight were needed, and the claw slam he received in Sunrise is also pretty good. He's probably the best pseudo Ivan in Sunrise, but that's a tarnished crown to wear if there ever was one. And in Base Rise especially, the ease of his fight and the length of some of his wind-ups are really just quite sad. Brute Tigrex is… okay. I'm not wild on volcanic subspecies. For me, the volcano has always felt like an extreme enough environment that monsters there should be specialised to the volcano only. Not just colour-swapped, stronger versions of normal monsters, but whatever. I think brutes being old, mature males would have been nice, but I also realise I can't keep peddling that out for every subspecies or deviant. Black does suit Tigrex, though. I'm not a big fan of Molten Tigrex, as you may be able to guess. The fight is okay, but it's also just the opposite of what Tigrex should be. For monsters like him, it's a display that in a world of flashy elements, Brute strength and prehistoric aggression are still every bit as relevant as fire or thunder, and non-elemental monsters can still hold their own, and even dominate. So to give him the flashy elements, for which the lack of used to differentiate him from a lot of his peers, again just feels like a regression more than anything else. Tigrex's design feels very much like a homage to 90s paleo art. He's very Greg Paulian with a sunken head and shrink-wrapped torso like the heroin-chic dinosaurs of the Renaissance. All this fed into making him feel hungry and aggressive very well. You get the impression with a few good meals he'd be a lot more even-tempered. But I did like his beefier 5th gen update, although I don't like that he lacks lips now. I also feel Tigrex is almost a response to everyone dunking on T-Rex for having such tiny arms so they remove the one thing most people would consider a flaw on the most powerful predatory dinosaur, and give it massive bear arms instead. Removing a common perception of animal weakness, and replacing it into a strength, is also something of a classic Monster Hunter design as well, like the whole concept of a land shark. As absolute power and the largest pseudo Ivan, Tigrex definitely suffers the least from the fact the trio are now massive in 5th gen, but at the same time I also wouldn't mind a size debuff for all of them. When Tigrex looks too big to really be sustaining itself with Popo, things have probably got out of hand. For Tigrex in the future, new moves should probably be the top priority. Tigrex is never going to fit a single environment quite like Naga does with the forests, but some more environmental interactions would be a good thing to display him as his title of absolute power. Again, the parallels to the Blosswivens come in here. You could and still can ledge Tigrex, something he shares with them that other Wyverns lack. Much like Diablos destroying the anthills and the sandy plains in Wildspire, as well as the Fisher, giving Tigrex more destruction-based ambience moves could be a good display of his power, 
as well as more Tigrex specific turf wars. I do enjoy Tigrex's theme and think it fits him and his fight very well, and my favourite is probably the original. One thing I forgot to add about Naga as well, is that whilst I think his Iceborne Mount rendition is the best version of his theme yet, and the Poke theme seeded in sounds great, it really should have been for Tigrex, who is always the demon of Poke Village, and like Naga, who really had nothing to do with the place. Although I do recognise that it'd be harder to fit into Tigrex's less complex theme. Now, a question often asked in recent months about flagships is, should they keep returning? And this is also applied to series regulars like Devil Joe and Diablos as well. The pseudo Ivans are as good a time as any to discuss this, with Tigrex and Nagakuga as two of the most popular monsters and flagships, and Barioth is also there. And my answer is both a yes and no. For one, I think their frequency returning overall is a bit overblown. Base World had few flagships returning. Narg and Barioth missed for you. Tigrex the Western third gen releases. Seregios and Gore from Worldborn, and the Brute Wyverns were pretty much stripped from Sunrise. But mainly, I personally think this is something of a Forest for the Trees discussion. We're going to get new monsters each game no matter what, but arguably the bigger influence will and should come from maps and biomes. Try irritated much of the existing fanbase because it felt like it replaced existing monsters with questionable remakes, instead of something brand new. And this was also due to the fact Try had the same five eco-zones as the games prior. Of course, they were going to be stepping on existing toes. World mostly dodged this. And yes, it reused a lot of environments, but the Rotten Vale and Coral Highlands were brand new, with completely endemic wildlife. The new continent lore was also used to fill old habitats like jungles with new monsters too. And thus it felt like it had a reason for the lack of old monsters. Until Iceborne botched much of that. I believe some monsters are just too good at what they do and how they're designed to be replaced. For example, if we keep getting jungle maps, I think you'd struggle to make a better stealthy jungle predator than Naga Kuga, and I'd much rather he keep coming back than get a bad rip-off of him. So the neatest solution is don't keep reusing tropical jungle maps. How about a northern temperate rainforest for once, like in British Columbia? Same thoughts with deserts and bloss wyverns. So why not a cold, high-altitude desert and mountain combo like the Gobi? Asking for all new monsters without a new biome roster is likely just going to result in another try. And so I'd say make the new maps more interesting with unseen biomes, and the new monsters will naturally follow. There's still plenty biomes we haven't properly immersed ourselves in yet. To say nothing of completely fictitious ones like the Vale and Highlands. As with the true flying wyverns, it's worth considering what the future may hold for the pseudo wyverns. And I still think there's room for a few more potentially. When water combat comes back, and I like to imagine if I keep saying it definitively it will, a tough jaguar-like pseudo wyvern that can swim after you and hunt underwater would be a pretty awesome addition. I also think a very quick but slender cheetah-based pseudo wyvern would be good for a fast-paced Odogron-like fight, in a nice savannah grassland-based map. Felids as a family have plenty of variation, but perhaps not enough for it to translate to tons of new fights. And not every biome needs its own one. There's only so much you can do with a family after all. But I definitely think there's room for a few more distinct pseudo wyverns. And any new one would be a pretty exciting addition. Even if I said that at the end of second gen, and well look how that turned out. Thanks for watching, and thanks to all of my patrons, but especially to the kindness of Mentos, K Sandum, Erengar Steini, Venomenom, Evi 11 y and Bazu Gazu Bakuhatsu Bakumatsu. A link is provided in the description for anyone interested, and I appreciate any amount you feel you can give. The excellent Tigrex Skull and Gamoth Age chart were created by creature design artist I Am the Kaiju King, and you can check out much more of his stuff on his Tumblr. For early access and exclusive pieces, you can also support him on Patreon too. Kaiju King also takes commissions, for both skulls and artwork, but also for scientific figures like the Gamoth chart, for you to beef out your own spec evo and fantasy projects with some official pieces. So be sure to check out his stuff. The unique digital artwork of Tigrex was custom created by Carmen Ryder Moten. Carmen has plenty of social media to follow her on for more pieces, as well as ones from the video, they're always making their own unique ones too. 
So be sure to follow them on their assorted social media to stay in the loop with all of their behavioural pieces. For some comments on Baryoth, Professor Simosukas pointed out that if juvenile Baryoth don't have their tusks yet, they may be able to eat much more muscle tissue until they approach the mother's size, and tusk development, with each kill being used much more efficiently by the youngsters until the sabers properly come in. Caelan Brown asked if Magnamalo could be a distant Baryoth relative, and with his weird arm blades, it is a theory I've seen others make, and really think could hold some water. Frosthawk also mentioned how Sand Baryoth may well have blue sabres from the copper blood of Carapacians, that may make up a fair chunk of its diet as the most common prey in deserts. For next time, it'll be another non-Monster Hunter video, but one I think most members of the fanbase should enjoy. So for now, I'll leave things vague. Ah. After that, it'll be another surprise as to who'll be covered, and if you want to have a say, there'll be a vote on Patreon, with a lot of fan favourites and frequent requests up in the poll. So hopefully it'll be a good one, and I'll see you there for it.